Good afternoon. It's so nice to be here. It's really just wonderfully lovely to visit your country for the first time. Went to the Taj Mahal yesterday. Um, really excited to be here. Um, I am part of the Buxbumps uh, Center for Clinical Excellence, so I'm delighted to be here in that aspect as well as the McLean Center. Um, and I've been at the University of Chicago for 10 years now, unbelievably. Um, and so it's just really a delight to see an affiliate of the university here in Delhi. And I hope to be able to come back sometime, maybe next year, <laughs> sometime soon. All right, um, I was told that this is already connected to the web. So I'm going to, um, oops, see if I can just show one clip. Let's see, please, let's get after. I just will activate, to just sort of set the stage for um, shared decision making and what I'm gonna talk about. We'll see if it works. Is the audio on? Okay. Service plan does this come with? Unlimited. Can I keep my same phone number? Absolutely. How do I change the ringtone? Just hook it up to your computer. Does it have a camera? What's the warranty? Does it come in silver? Can I put my party shuffle on this? Does it have a 3.5 millimeter headset jack? You sell a lot of these? It's the one I carry. You ever get those phantom vibrations in your pocket? Any questions? No. Are you sure? Yeah. Ask questions for the 10 questions. So this one, I'm gonna show you one other quick one. <clears throat> so, do you have any questions? What is your soup of the day? Uh, we have a mulligatani soup. Oh, do you have any specials? We have a steak special today. Oh, how's that cooked? That's pan seared and then... Pan. Does it come with a side dish? Is it grilled? Can I have it steamed? So, what do you recommend? What kind of pie do you have? You're an actor. Aren't you from Ohio? Any questions? Ask questions. For the 10 questions everyone should know, go to ahrq.gov. All right, so that for me is always a nice way to start um, the conversation and um, show how challenging it can be sometimes for patients to um, be super active in all other facets of their life, but still when they get to the doctor, they suddenly have no questions, they don't feel as empowered. Um, and these are people in these um, videos that otherwise um, seem fairly um, to have high levels of literacy and health literacy and affluence, all these sort of advantages that we normally associate with people being able to navigate their way in the world. Um, so then if we imagine our most vulnerable patients who may not have finished formal education, who may or may not speak the language that's um, the primary language in the country, who may not be there legally, who may um, have a lot of stigma associated with their social identity, um, that power imbalance between just uh, physicians and patients becomes is significantly exacerbated. And so a lot of the work that I do um, tries to figure out how we can, amongst those uh, most vulnerable people in our, in our community, um, try and realign that sense of balance um, and shift the center of power a little bit so that they can um, be more fully human um, and more uh, fully empowered. Um, this is, again, sort of starting with the doctor-patient relationship that we understand to sort of be the foundation for clinical medicine. Um, and this uh, slide is, uh, it's, it's sort of nice to come later in the day um, because what some of what I'm going to be talking about echoes some of the other uh, speakers. It's also a bit of a, a downer because I have such a high bar after speaking with <laughs> David and uh, Rajana and other people that are so uh, wonderful, so uh, bear with me. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that uh, although this is a didactic experience that I really uh, prefer to have people sort of raise their hand and interject along, um, and I know that we have time at the end, but if at any point someone has a comment or a question, um, then that would be totally delightful uh, for me to be able to, t to stop. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is sort of what is shared decision making, why we think it's important, um, what are some of the barriers to this process, particularly amongst, um, again, our more vulnerable populations? And what is the sociopolitical context um, that can impact shared decision making? Most of my work, um, uh, as Dr. Uh, Kumar uh, alluded to, is really deals with health disparities in African Americans who have diabetes in sort of nationally in the U.S., but also sort of very fo uh, focused in the uh, context of the south side of Chicago. 
but there are significant parallels not only between our healthcare system in the United States to what occurs here in India, the more that I've been sort of listening, like, oh yeah, we have that too. Um, <laughs> but also just the uh, class issues um, that also in our country sort of fall along racial lines um, between those who have and those who don't, um, and what that means as far as people's ability to navigate the healthcare system and navigate society and then ultimately be well or not well. And so we'll talk a little bit about, about that as well. So just starting off so that we're all on the same page about what shared decision making is and is not, um, it's uh, helpful to sometimes think, think about the larger context in which there are other kind of participatory decision making styles. So we think about paternalism on one end, where the physician is making the majority of the decisions, um, autonomy, patient autonomy on another end, where the patient is making most of the decisions, and then sort of shared in the middle. And as I'm doing this, I realize I should probably put that in the middle. Um, but really, we th uh, uh, shared decision making is one that draws on both the expertise of patients and physicians, as well as the health values of patients and physicians. And so, and when I, I use physicians, uh, the term physician is a shorthand for just clinical provider. So recognizing that we have a broad range of people who provide medical care. Um, and we have different values. So I myself may prefer quality of life over quantity of life, but our patients may have something that's different. Um, Someone earlier was mentioning uh, that their, I think it was David, that their patient's goals were to see the Cubs win and to see a female president. Um, and that may not have been what I had in mind when I was managing uh, someone's chronic disease. Um, and so understanding, taking the time to understand those values as well as to honor those values and bring those into decision making um, choices I think is really important. Um, and also to recognize that patients have expertise in just being patients. <laughs> And it's one thing to prescribe medications or to, <laughs> to order a VQ scan or to you know, order various tests. And it's another thing to actually experience those and live those. And the more that I'm a patient um, myself, it seems to like really hone in the pathophysiology that I learned you know, 20 years prior. I'm like, because I had a VQ scan before, and I'm like, that's what that means, VQ mismatch. Like, I, like somehow it really sort of drives home what we know in our, in our um, heads when we experience it as patients. And so recognizing that patients have all kind of expertise in taking multiple drug re regimens, trying to remember um, which ones are which, what it means when we switch medications. We want people to be on cost-efficient generic medications. The downside is that they could be a blue round pill one day and a green square pill the next day. And for people who have low health literacy, how does that manage, uh, how does that affect their overall medication adherence and their understanding of their disease and their, and their health? And so. Um, shared decision making uh, ideally sort of brings all of those things into bear as we try to make decisions that are best for that patient um, and the conditions in, in the context of their lives. Um, and we typically think about it as having sort of three domains, information sharing, you learn about the patients, um, you tell them about uh, things that are relevant for their health condition. Um, deliberation or physician recommendation, so really thinking about the pros and cons of the treatments um, and patient preferences being elicited during that time, and then implementing a plan of care, ultimately deciding on a plan and um, working through all the potential barriers to that plan and making sure that um, it's something that everyone feels confident that patients are, that can do and actually want to do. Um, and so these are the three again. Um, I do a lot of patient education um, as part of my work. And we would talk to patients, we don't uh, say we're doing information sharing, deliberation or decision making slash implementation. Um, we teach patients um, about the three Ds or we say, we'll tell them discuss, debate and decide. So as you are um, sitting in with your own physician, um, to remember that you want to make sure that you're having a full discussion at the beginning of the clinic practice, that there's a friendly conversation, a debate, not an argument, um, but um, that you have a sense that you have an understanding of the, the pros and cons of all the things that are on the table, and that then you come to a decision, you sort of close the loop and, and um, leave that clinic visit, understanding what all those little pieces of paper <laughs> were that the physician gave you. Is this a prescription? Is this an order for a test? Exactly where am I supposed to be going? Um, and feeling like you have the good understanding and knowledge to, um, and support system at home uh, to be able to, to follow through on the plan of care. Um, and so some of the reasons that we think uh, shared decision making is important um, has been highlighted through uh, like the Institute of Medicine um, in their report that came out 15, 16 years ago now about crossing the quality chasm and where they really define patient-centeredness um, as uh, sort of a key element in how we define quality of care. So it's not only 
um, as our introductory speaker was mentioning, sort of a soft science or something that is um, to be poo-pooed, but something that actually is a core part of how we consider um, measuring and quantifying and evaluating quality of care. Um, and patient-centeredness, I would say, is really um, how we define shared decision-making, so one that establishes a partnership amongst practitioners, patients, and their families to ensure not only that decisions respect patients' wants, needs, and preferences, but also that patients have the education and support they require to make these decisions and to participate in their own care. Um, because a lot of times uh, that health literacy or patient knowledge about the, the options and their health conditions is a significant barrier to them participating in their care. So it's not just that you throw out some options and then see if they can decide, but really um, give them the tools that uh, they need to be able to make an informed decision with you. So why do we think it's important? Uh, well, lots of reasons. Um, it really is central to how we are thinking about managing chronic disease as practitioners now with sort of activated patients at their core. Um, and I really appreciate uh, David's presentation about all the ways in which um, the CCP is trying to put patients back at the core of healthcare delivery and not just patients themselves and thinking about their, their continuity of care experience, but the context in which they live, what's important as far as their um, social determinants of health, their um, immediate support needs, all of those things, and that the, the patient-physician relationship is um, paramount to how patients are experiencing this. So having activated patients is really central to how we think about managing chronic disease, which is how we used to do it, and now not doing it some more, and then now coming back in fashion. <laughs> I'm coming back to the old. Um, and this just being the chronic care model, um, which really sort of just reminds us that we have um, a whole system in place in which patients um, traverse not just the healthcare system, but the community. Sometimes they're patients, sometimes they're people. We're always people, but we, we take on the label of patients when we're in the healthcare system um, and all the other things that need to be put in place to manage chronic diseases. Um, it also correlates with health um, indicators with, with good health outcomes, which um, several of our previous speakers have already mentioned. So we know that we can diagnose things better, that patients have more informed consent, but it also um, is associated with improved things that are important to me as a diabetes um, health services researcher as far as diabetes control, blood pressure control, length of stay for hospitalizations. And again, then we think that these interpersonal um, issues around feeling confident that people can make decisions, being satisfied with their care, adhering to the, uh, the plan of care, trusting their physician, understanding what's happening, all of these are key um, mediators uh, to the process between how we talk to patients um, and the kind of health that they actually ultimately experience. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which gives me a chance to sort of take some water, yes. So, so going back to your previous slide, uh, where you were talking about outcomes and mm -hmm. improved glucose control. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, so here's a, a, a patient who is not, who's uh, educated, has a high school education. Mm -hmm. okay. So what would you be saying to him or her when you meet to ensure that eventually translates into glucose control. Right. I, I, let me, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, so I'm going to try and answer it, and if, if I don't get to it, then, then let me. What, 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 what background that you, you said they're not uh, medically literate, mm -hmm. literate glucose, so what background would you say to them? What sort of a discussion would you be having with a patient? So Give someone who. Them sufficient literacy such that it translates into improved glucose control. Absolutely. So um, the first half of this talk is sort of this kind of stuff, and the second half is actually an example of an intervention that we're gonna do, where we specifically are targeting low income, low health literacy um, participants and trying to get their diabetes control better. So thank you for the, the foreshadowing plug. Um, we'll have more of an opportunity to talk about those kinds of things. Any other comments while we're taking a little pause? Okay. Um, but it's also obviously key and important to the quality of the physician-patient relationship. So again, higher levels of patient satisfaction and trust. Visits are actually more efficient over time for the reasons um, that David laid out. Um, it's an investment. And so whether that investment be um, in the transition between inpatient care and outpatient care or just outpatient care alone, that it ultimately um, 
makes visits more efficient because you know the patient. You a lot, a lot of times when we think about difficult patients or ones that may be frustrating because they don't show up for clinic or they don't take their medications or things that are um, hand wringing to us as providers. Many times there are underlying issues that. Um, that exist with either their social, social circumstances at home or with how they're interacting with us as providers. And they don't quite believe what we're saying or don't quite trust that we have their best interests at heart or there are other issues that make it challenging for them to be what we would consider to be good patients. And getting to uh, the heart of that matter early on um, means that future visits, you don't have to deal with this, these same sort of issues over and over that you've um, to the degree possible, have dealt with some of those and can move on to a more therapeutic relationship. So, visits, uh, so visits actually become more efficient over time. Um, and uh, you're less likely to get sued. So physicians actually will not sue their doctor if they like them, which may or may not be a good thing. It's a good thing for us, um, but we do know that there are fewer malpractice claims if people like their doctor and feel like um, they understand that doctors are human too and that mistakes sometimes happen. Um, and there's less doctor swapping, so getting to um, back to the idea of continuity of care and why that is or is not good for people's health as well as costs. Um, so there's less of that when there's more shared decision making. Um, so. But there are a lot of, this sounds really good, but it's really challenging in clinical practice. Um, and we've talked in the conversation earlier today just about how challenging it can be for us with time constraints um, to be the kind of ideal physician we would like to be if we had an hour per patient as opposed to 20 minutes or, or less, or sometimes you know a little bit more, but patients are really complicated. So as a general internist, I'm always frustrated by the fact that I get the same amount of time as a subspecialist does. I'm like, they have one organ. <laughs> like, I have like 15 problems, you know, to try and do all of these things and their preventive care. And so, um, so it, it, it's a challenge. Um, and so some of the barriers that come up a lot when physicians are thinking about shared decision making, the, the biggest thing is time pressure. Like, will I have the time to be able to do that? And again, um, one of the things that I like to counter with is that actually it's an investment in time as well as the relationship and that has sort of a positive uh, return on investment and so that you actually get that time back. Um, that there are limited resources, um, clinical uncertainty, um, and that patients sometimes experience physicians in a way that uh, um, is different than, than what we envision it as. So meaning that we're taught in medical school to interview patients in a certain way, to ask a review of systems. So, and patients are accustomed to, or as people, we're accustomed to telling our story. And as providers, we oftentimes don't have time for all that. So, well, it all started when, you know, we'll stop them. Are you having chest pain? Palpitations, shortness of breath, you know, and we run through our list as opposed to letting people sort of feel like their story is being uh, told. A lot of times we'll miss key things when we don't allow them to have their story. But we also miss an opportunity that um, patients will sometimes shut down and um, it affects the kind of the, the quality and the quantity of information we're subsequently able to get out of that en encounter. So there are a number of physician reported barriers to even starting the process for shared decision making. And amongst patients, again, um, getting to how I started the conversation off is about um, how physicians and patients inherently have the power imbalance. And when that gets exacerbated by issues of social identity, our class, race, ethnicity, language, literacy, um, documentation status, where and how we live, who we are, who we have sex with, all of those things can exacerbate um, the sense that I have, am entitled to ask questions or to have a certain quality of care. Um, and literacy and health literacy, I've learned multiple times over, are not the same thing. And so we assume often wrongly that because our patients are educated or well-educated that they actually understand what we're saying, and oftentimes they don't. Um, and as an oncologist, I'm sure you've seen, or even I've experienced, so I'm actually a cancer survivor, and my husband is an English teacher. And when I first went in for care, I didn't retain anything that was told to me. And all the questions, all the, all the good questions came from my husband who had, you know, he's an English teacher. And so even just having uh, literacy is not necessarily a proxy for health literacy. Um, and then for a, particularly for vulnerable populations, just having the confidence um, and the sense that it's okay, I have the right to ask questions or to be here or to receive care is, is a big challenge. Um, and the issues that come with that around uh, a trust or a lack of trust to providers, fear and denial, that people often use coping strategies for dealing with chronic diseases that they may not feel like they have the um, 
the control over the financial or physical or sort of cognitive control over, um, and then just normative beliefs that happen within communities that are uh, chronically vulnerable. And so how information is transferred within that community setting, um, how a community comes to view health and unhealth, you know, disease and, and healthiness um, uh, impacts uh, what patients anticipate to be their experience for health and for healthcare and healthcare navigation. So all of these are, are things that are um, very uh, real that we don't really get taught a lot in medical school how to deal with, but really are significant barriers if we don't address them into having um, not only good doctor-patient relationships, but also to engaging patients more broadly and improving their health. Oops. So this is just um, periodically I'm going to throw in references um, from papers that we've written. So I'm, um, because I'm a, a product of both the McLean Center for Ethics and for the Buxbaum, a lot of the work that I'm doing around disparities I'm using as um, sort of a, a model um, in talking to you guys. And so I'll, I have references here just for should you want them later. So uh, what is the sociopolitical context that can impact shared decision making? And so again, this next slide is really going to talk about African Americans. Um, uh, but I think there are parallels for any marginalized uh, community. Um, and so for us, obviously, the big thing was slavery and the period after slavery. So most of none of my peers have anyone that we know in our family that, are, that uh, at any point in time was a slave. Um, but we do have people that are in our family that survived uh, or lived through the Great Migration. So I, I'm in Chicago now. And so um, there's a period of significant racial segregation um, right after slavery associated with a lot of violence. Um, because previously when people were slaves, their life was hard. Um, but at least there was a, a monetary value associated with your life, so people were less likely to try and kill you. Um, whereas after slavery ended in the South, there was no monetary value associated with, with black lives. And so um, that's when there was a, a huge um, sur uh, implementation or sort of development of things like the Ku Klux Klan and other um, infrastructure policy um, practices within the community um, to... Um, to devalue um, the lives of African Americans. And so there are two different waves subsequently of people leaving the South um, to northern cities, and so Chicago being one of them. So I talk a, a fair bit about that in Chicago because most of the people who come to um, our clinics who are African Americans either came directly from the South, actually was born and raised in the South myself, um, or their parents or grandparents did. And so there's a sort of a cultural legacy of this experience. Um, and that race is really a social construct, much more than it is a biological construct. And so for people of the African diaspora, no matter where they are in the world, the color of our skin impacts um, how people view us. And so that for us in the United States, there are persistent, so over time, um, many generations today, as well as many generations ago. And so we see that a lot this, um, coming into play this past two, several years with a lot of the uh, um, people taking video of uh, gun violence and police uh, shootings and things like that. And so things that we have uh, known within the African-American community for a long time are now being sort of publicly seen and experienced. Um, and the outrage that has been expressed, for me, is um, sort of a, a way of a manifestation of a disbelief of a community. So for years, Black people have been saying that police are killing us. Um, you know, we are not doing anything wrong. They said I had a gun, but I really did not. Um, and as a society, we have chosen that, uh, not to believe uh, people when they say this. And so it's only now that we're actually catching these things on tape that everyone's like, oh my God, those people were innocent. <laughs> and now they're getting shot. And so um, all of these persistent, pervasive structural inequities in our society that fall um, along racial lines, as well as many other lines, um, are significant um, for these communities. And they're not only organizational, but interpersonal, and those are bi-directional. So the way that our society is set up impacts how people choose to relate to one another. And the way that choose pe people choose to relate to one another impacts future policies. Um, and so it's sort of this cycle um, that continues despite a lot of progress that's been made in our country. And so for any marginalized community, there are um, survival strategies or coping strategies that people develop to try and figure out how to how to get along, how to not be shot, um, how to you know be healthy, and some of that. Uh, this is 
obviously coming back to this idea of healthcare and healthcare inequities, that some of these st survival strategies around uh, deference to power, for example, police power, um, code switching, that we'll say one thing when we're in a comfortable group of peers or people that look like us, and we'll talk and act and behave in other ways when we're not, um, those transmit themselves into other settings. So um, physician, excessive physician deference are, is often um, a way that people are used to communicating with power structures um, in our society. And so it shouldn't be surprising that some of our patients may not feel as empowered um, because they don't feel empowered as empowered in many aspects of their lives. Um, and so as we're thinking about um, trying to engage patients and to empower patients, we have to really understand the social political context from which they come and address those issues as well as the, the actual individual that's sitting in front of us. We know that um, how people communicate with us in the clinical setting um, contributes to health disparities. No, so not just um, you know, health overall, but the differences that we see in health between vulnerable communities and uh, those that are not. Um, so there's less shared decision making, less participatory visits, less positive affect, less sort of um, the, the, the positive things that lead to good uh, physician-patient uh, relationships. So less of that that occurs within vulnerable populations. Some of the work, uh, yes. Yeah, so it's a term that um, really was uh, initially developed the, a way of thinking um, by African Americans. So the idea that you have a dual identity, that we're black, um, but we're also sort of living in a way, it sort of gets to this, this slide actually right here. Um, we understand how society views us, and so sometimes when we're around other black people, let's say, we can talk and act in one way, and when we're not, we have to talk and act in another way, so we sort of switch between two codes. Exactly, um, and it's a whole lot of things other than just behavior, and it has also now most currently or commonly been used for people that identify as part of the LGBT community, um, and so they might um, switch their identities so that they will be very straight when they're in a heterosexual environment, perhaps at work or um, in other environments, and then in um, a different private personal setting, which is different and more, more or whatever. So it's just sort of going back and forth between how um, you present yourself depending on the environment that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually have been funded by one of the uh, federal research agencies, AHRQ, the people who did those little funny videos at the beginning, um, to think about shared decision making in racial and ethnic minorities who also identify um, as part of the LGBT um, community, so people who are dual minorities, because we know that um, there's racism within the LGBT community, and there is um, a lot of um, heterosexism uh, within the black community or within a lot of uh, racial and ethnic minority communities. And so we're looking at people who are dual minorities um, and sort of dually marginalized and what that means for their ability to navigate health systems and to have good health care. Um, and so we've developed some conceptual models um, to sort of think about that. The first is that people, um, as individuals, we have multiple identities at the same time. So race, ethnicity and culture, sexuality, age, gender, socioeconomic status, um, and they all impact each other. So being a black man may be something different um, if you're gay than being a black woman if you're gay in the United States. And so all of these different things that sort of shape how much power we do or don't have um, based on the multiple different identities sort of resides within us, but also we understand how our perception of ourselves is affected by how we think or know that society views us. So the amount of power that's assigned to a social class. Um, so for gender, it's mainly men. For race, it's mainly whites. For class, it's mainly people who have money. So some certain identities are associated with power, others that are not associated with power. And so those are multiplicative in nature if you're multiply marginalized. Um, and so understanding not just who you are, but how society views that social status or the multiple social statuses that you carry um, impacts your perception of yourself. And so there's that, and there's also the lens, and so I usually like to refer to my glasses when I have them on. I need bifocals, but I refuse to wear them because I'm too vain, so I can't really see the, see the audience and my slides, so I just I just take them off. Um, but we view 
the, the world, um, we view encounters, not just clinical encounters, but all encounters through a lens that's affected by our internal biases that we know that we all carry. And so um, those could be good things or bad things, um, but we all view those. And so both patients and providers are seeing not only, not, not only carrying the social baggage of themselves and the identity that we have as patients or as physicians, but we're also viewing the other person that's sitting in the room through these lenses um, of social identity. And so, so it really gets kind of to be a mess. Um, so let's say this is a patient and that's a provider. Again, thinking about all the social identities that were in the first slide, um, this lens through which patients and providers are viewing themselves, all of that is sort of there as in social baggage that people are bringing then to an encounter where we're then trying to establish trust, think about decision-making preferences, um, do all of these things around shared decision-making, and ultimately have these sort of mechanisms to lead to health. And so it's really complicated. So it's not just people and who they are and how they see themselves, but all of the verbal and nonverbal communication that's affecting an encounter all at the same time in the context in which Oh, you can't even actually even see it down here. There's clinic and community and society, all of these things which ultimately impact um, people's health. So it's um, just a, a, a way of helping me and us as providers think about ways in which we are um, viewing our vulnerable patients and ways in which they may be viewing us and how that might impact the kind of uh, communication that we're having or not having in the, in the clinic. So this is all of it sort of put together in the same space. So, um, and this is a, a, a paper that actually is out now, it came out a few months ago about that. One of the things that, um, the reason that I talk about this study is just the idea of implicit bias um, or discrimination, perceptions of discrimination, rea real versus sort of actual. And so we did a study um, a few years back um, looking at people who reported racial discrimination in healthcare and what that uh, was associated with as far as their diabetes health outcomes. And so we looked at um, three different kind of categories, so outcomes meaning quality of care, um, outcomes being self-management behaviors, and outcomes being diabetes complications. And what we found were that people who, of any race, so this was not a population of African Americans, um, it included all races, so um, the, the binary variable was self-reported uh, racial discrimination, not actually the kind of, uh, not type of race. Uh, self, who self-reported discrimination in healthcare had about half, uh, sometimes less of the odds of having uh, what we consider to be standard of care for diabetes, um, and about twice the rate of complications from uh, diabetes. So diabetes-related foot disorders, which is, uh, leads to lower extremity amputations, a significant problem in the United States, um, and diabetes-related uh, retinopathy, which leads to blindness, so one of the most common causes in the United States. Um, but no associations with self-management behaviors. So um, what this helped us to, the conclusions that we came to um, were that perceived discrimination in healthcare amongst patients who have diabetes, again, is associated with lower quality of care, um, poor health outcomes, but not self-management. Um, we did find that race and class attenuated these associations in ways that sort of make intuitive sense. Um, but our take home was that health behaviors may not be on the ca causal pathway to outcomes for um, perceptions of discrimination amongst patients who have diabetes. So perceiving that bad things are happening to you in the um, clinical setting does not necessarily mean that you're gonna respond to those in ways that are bad uh, as far as health behaviors, but maybe in, in and of themselves, a manifestation of reality as far as quality of care that you're receiving and may have impacts on your health. Um, and then last, I was just gonna mention before I transition into talking about our intervention, is a paper that we did sort of trying to better understand what shared decision making means to patients, um, not just for us as um, academics and how we conceptualize different kinds of models. Um, and so again, these are the three domains that have typically been described uh, to cons uh, comprise shared decision making. And when we actually talk to patients, what they described was something that looks more like this. So much more complicated, um, and I'll just sort of uh, point to some of the behavioral um, and nonverbal ways in which patients were saying that uh, they would do in order to sort of uh, manifest their patient preferences. So they may just not take the pills, and that was not a manifestation of the fact that they didn't want to be healthy. It's their way of expressing their choice. Um, and so uh, there are two quotes that I have um, from some qualitative work that we did. So one person said, the doctor told me that I need to go to the dermatologist. Now the lady up there at the checkout desk, I told her that I didn't want to go. That if the skin growth oops, goes oops, 
down, then I don't see a reason to operate. So I'll just have to think about that. And then the person says, well, did you tell your doctor that you weren't planning on going? Well, I didn't tell my doctor about my preference for not messing with it. I just told her that I would go through with it. So she goes to the doctor. The doctor says, oh my gosh, this might be skin cancer. You know, let's, let's do something. You need to go see the uh, you know, specialist. And she says, okay, sure, I'll go. She goes to the checkout desk and says, no, I'm not. I've decided that I'll wait and see if it gets worse. And if it does, then I'll call you back to make the appointment. If not, I think I'm going to be good. Um, and then another quote, someone said, some African-Americans still don't believe in everything the doctors say. I have a neighbor and she goes to the doctor and when she gets medication, she throws it in the garbage can. So that made me think for, as a, from a quality perspective of uh, sort of process mapping this. So this is someone who calls for an appointment. Oh, Dr. Pete can't see you for two weeks. No problem. I'll wait two weeks. They come in to see me. They wait in the waiting room for 45 minutes. They get roomed. They tell me their problem. I say, oh, I think I know what it is. How about this? They say, great. Take the piece of paper, go to the pharmacy, wait in line, pay some medication, get the pills, then go home. Then say, you know, I'm not really sure about that. I'm not going to, you know, because I have some issues, I'm underlying issues, I'm going to throw the medication away. So this, this sort of cognitive dissonance that sometimes happens when people have multiple identities and multiple experiences. We live in the United States. Medicines are supposed to be great. Doctors are supposed to be great. But on the other hand, I have these sort of issues, and I'm not really sure that I think that this is going to be great. And so behaviors that sometimes seem a little um, oxymoronic or paradoxical um, are experienced by people who are vulnerable um, in, in lots of different ways because they're experiencing life in multiple different ways that may not um, be uh, aligned. Any comments, question? I didn't remember, so I wasn't sure if anyone wanted to share their hand. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think we all can relate to this or just some of the confusion. Um, some people come back and you're like, well, your blood pressure is still high. You know, are you taking the medication? Oh, yes, I am. I'm like, that's so funny because it should be working. I'm just going to increase the dose and then we'll see what happens. And so, yeah, there, there are all of these things that sometimes happen um, that we're not even aware of um, in the clinical encounter that we're completely missing uh, for underlying reasons that may be driving some of the health disparities that we see because we aren't necessarily in tune to all of the different dynamics that are occurring. So I want to talk a little bit about a project that we have on the south side of Chicago, which um, we've all sort of described as being um, an area that's challenged with um, limited resources, um, primarily African-American and working class. I'm going to speed this up. Um, <laughs> so this is our conceptual model. Again, we, we built it. Oh. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's Marshall Chin, that's my boss. Um, this is part of our team, um, and it's been sort of a changing team over time. It's me in the middle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, that is not her. Um, <laughs> maybe her to win, but, but not her. Um, I'm sorry? All right, so there she is again, okay. but not Ranjana. <laughs> and one more time, not her. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know, exactly. <laughs> Can you show that picture one more time? I swear that's her. No, it's not. Um, so we have a lot of different core components of it, including one around patient activation, so engaging patients that are challenging to engage a lot of times. Um, and so we have, uh, th these are just, I, took screenshots of our website because when we first went live, I was so, so proud of it and so excited. I kept taking pictures of it. Um, and this is one of the patients from our first diabetes education class and one of the nurse providers that teaches our classes with us. And um, so what we do is we have training and shared decision making. So uh, we have a culturally tailored diabetes education program I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and we incorporate shared decision making into that. So getting at some of the health literacy issues as well as combining that with um, role playing and other kinds of narrative experiences around shared decision making. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So we, so lots of ways. We do a lot of recruitment by um, contacting patients who we know have diabetes and have an upcoming visit. We recruit from patient uh, waiting rooms. We ask physicians for referrals, which one of the things happened is that people were like, oh, Dr. Peek said I should come. I'm feeling kind of special. Um, and, and so they were more, you know, they're kind of more made, motivated when they knew that a physician had thought enough about them to recommend them for a program. Um, it's 
pretty popular, and so people will refer their friends. Um, they're invited to bring their social support team to the classes um, as non-research participants, but they'll also say, you know, I have someone who has diabetes, can she come to the next class? And so we have a lot of word of mouth referrals as well. Um, and so we talk a lot about in the class about race as a social construct, what that means, um, your rights as patients, all of those things, and we make it very interactive. Um, and so I'm going to show you. Oh, so a lot of people like the class. Our recruitment is good, um, and we have a high retention rate. We found improvements in people's confidence, um, self-efficacy, their self-management behaviors, as well as their diabetes. I'm going to show you more slides um, at the end. Um, so again, we, we do a lot of things that, that uh, feel... Uh, that regular people do. People like to tell their stories. People like to be in groups and have social support. Um, instead of t telling people to eat completely differently, we just try and modify traditional diets. Um, and again, we've made uh, games and videos that um, help sort of translate some abstract constructs in ways that are more e easy for people to understand. All right, so here's where, here's this video that the clip doesn't work, but this one does. So I'm going to see if it'll play. Hello, Mrs. Robinson. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. And you? I'm well, thanks. How have you been? Well, I've been pretty good. Good, good. Uh, have you noticed anything unusual or different about how you've been feeling? No, everything's about the same. And have you been taking your medication and checking your diet? Well, yes. I I've been pretty good. I've been eating all my vegetables because I know you said that was important. And I've been taking all my medications too every day. Okay, that's great. That's mm -hmm. really important, Mrs. Robinson. Mm -hmm. now, are you experiencing any fatigue or other symptoms? No, sir. I feel about the same. Well, okay, if everything's the same, let's keep you on your current medication and you can come back and see me in three months, okay? Okay. But Grandma, did right. you tell him about the sore in your foot? It's just a little sore and I don't think it should Anything to worry about. She has a sore on her foot, Dr. Woods. She says it hurts and she's tired all the time. You have a sore on your foot? Mm hmm Well, have you been wearing proper shoes and checking your feet every day? Yes, I have. All right, okay, then let's uh, take a look, okay? Well, it's just a little sore, but it don't even hurt that much, but it's on my right foot. Well, I do see some redness and some signs of infection, but I believe that's a result of your diabetic condition. Now the infection is still in its early stages, but it's important that we address this because some serious problems could occur as a result. Okay, doctor, I understand. There are two ways to handle the problem with your foot. I can give you some antibiotics, which should clear up the problem, or we could have you see a foot specialist. Uh... You know, I think I'm gonna have you see the foot specialist. Whatever you think is best, Dr. Woods. I've got a referral slip for you to see the foot specialist. Call his office, make an appointment, and they should take care of you. Oh, I, I, I can't see the foot specialist today. I, I have to make an appointment. Yes, I'm afraid so. But I have to work all week, and I don't think I can take off another day so Mrs. soon. Mrs. Robinson, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but we don't have a podiatrist in this office, so you're going to have to make an appointment to call. Okay, I will call as soon as I get home. Great, glad to hear that. You know, it's also time for your flu shot, so I'm going to send the nurse in, and she can take care of that for you. Okay, doctor, thank you. Uh, have a, you have a nice day. You're welcome. Mrs. Robinson? Grandma never made that appointment. So that's um, a clip from a larger video that we made um, that we use in our classes and other ways to help sort of uh, communicate that. Um, Having a pleasant relationship with your doctor doesn't necessarily mean the same as shared decision-making. Um, slideshow. I'm current slide. So just to quickly run through these, um, we saw improvements in diabetes self-management behaviors, um, shared decision-making, um, and some health outcomes as far as diabetes control, some glucose measures, and most importantly, we thought sort of at the bottom, huh, which you can't see, is... Um, self-reported mental health, which was uh, significantly improved at baseline and uh, stayed at six months. This one I don't think is going to work either. We're going to see. 
Okay, so this is, uh, we, we sometimes use the video in community settings, and so we work with the food pantry uh, where we showed it, and, there was, and then we interviewed people just randomly afterwards and said, ah, what'd you think about the video? So this is just a little clip of a woman talking about what that meant just seeing the five or 10 minute movie, um, how she interpreted that, and what she was gonna do as far as her next doctor visit, and how she'd already sort of made some decisions about communicating with her physician and prioritizing her health. Well, watching the video with the grandmother and not keeping everything secrets here from the doctor, I thought that was bad because I do it. But as of today, I won't do it again because she had that big bruise on her leg and the doctor should have knew about that. And she had a sore on her foot. I don't get all that stuff, but believe me, after watching that video today, I'm going to tell my doctor everything that's going on because I have fatigue and tiredness and I just be worn out. So it helped me a whole lot today. A whole lot. Do you feel like when you go see your doctor now, you have that two-way conversation, or do you feel like you're able to do that? Yeah, but see, my doctor, he's well. In ten minutes, I gotta so I'm gonna have to let him know. No, I need twelve minutes yeah, or thirteen. Exactly. I gotta explain some things to you from this little movie I watched, and I need to let him know what's going on because I'm real secretive with my doctor. Because you know, a lot of people you can't trust. Yeah. And I'm going to have to gain his trust and I'm just going to have to open up and let him know about my health because I don't. Yeah, I know. keep everything to myself. No, but I mean, it's a big step, you know. Like we said, yeah. we were just talking. It's emotional. Yeah. Talking about your health, you're talking about you. And if you're not taking care of yourself, then who is going to stand up for you? So That's I think it's right. great. You're on your way to kind of like taking that step. Yeah, I got an appointment next week. <laughs> awesome. And this is just a paper sort of about our general project. I think that might be it. Um, so pictures from the south side, our team, and then just sort of again acknowledging the centers in which I sit at the university. So um, I can't remember what time I started, uh, but I think there's a few minutes, hopefully, um, for questions. And I appreciate people sort of interjecting throughout. And then I'll see you guys again on Friday to talk more about things like this. So thank you.